As I said, we were standing by for Robert Patman, our uh, expert on uh, all things Ukraine and international affairs, and he joins us uh, now. Robert, good to see you. Thank you uh, for making the time. Um, quite a week, quite a week in Ukraine, and this uh, issue involving a well, not a missile strike. It now seems uh, in neighbouring Poland. Do we now have a clearer picture of what happened in Poland and how these two deaths occurred? I don't think we have a definitive account, but what appears on the ev evidence so far, at least provided from NATO sources, um, is that um, an air defence missile reacting to a massive attack by Russia on that day on Ukraine's largely civilian infrastructure, um, that, that air defence missile either was deflected in the course of hitting an incoming Russian missile or simply strayed and landed in Poland. So, yes, it, it, it's all the evidence seems to so far suggest it was a Ukrainian missile. Uh, but, you know, we mustn't confuse cause and effect here. That air defence missile would not have been launched unless Ukraine was facing a missile attack from Russia. And it right. was a massive attack. That's a good Involving point. more than 90, yeah. More than 90 missiles, you say? Yes, yes. And that They're targeting is... things like electricity, power, heating systems, water, designed really to make the winter, snow has begun to fall in Kyiv, make the winter a pretty difficult experience for many Ukrainians. Up to 35% of Ukraine at the moment is facing power cuts. And really it's an attempt to compensate for the fact that the Russian army is getting the worst of it on the ground and being pushed back. It's under relentless pressure now in the east following the loss of Kherson. And Mr. Putin is trying to take advantage of the advantage he currently has in missiles. But, of course, one of the ironies, Sean, of this incident is that it's likely to result in more sophisticated modern air defence systems for Ukraine. Uh, some have already arrived, but... Uh, that will close the window of vulnerability that the Ukraine faces at the moment in its skies from Russian missiles. Yeah, that's interesting, Robert, a and the change in, in, I guess, tactics from, from the Russians. Is this in, uh, some, in some ways an admission that despite that mobilisation and, and the, um, you know, their attempt to build up their ground forces and, and their, you know, personnel on the ground, that they are running out of stomach for, you know, boots-on-the-ground conflict in Ukraine? Well, they've certainly boosted their manpower, but, the, you know, you cannot underestimate the scale of their defeat around Kherson. Kherson was the first regional capital that Russia uh, captured as part of its invasion of Ukraine, full-scale invasion, which began in February of this year. Um the uh, this was the one territorial gain that the Putin regime has succeeded I in doing. Uh, our listeners should recall that Mr. Putin tried to seize Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, within the first few days, failed, was rebuffed, was driven back east, and now the one uh, incontestable claim or gain, I should say, he made has now been lost. So Mr. Putin's under a lot of pressure. They've had a Russia has mobilised more than three hundred thousand. Uh, many of these troops, are, many of these newly recruited soldiers are poorly trained. Some have had no training and some are poorly equipped. And um, it, it, there's a tremendous demoralization uh, within Russian ranks at the moment. So, you know, I don't think the Ukrainians will be letting, uh, letting up with the military momentum they've got. And, um, yeah, Mr. M Mr. M uh, Putin has no intention of giving up the 20% of Ukraine is currently under his possession, but he's on the back foot. Mm. Getting back to the Polish incident, and clearly uh, the Poles and NATO are not going to escalate this situation and, you know, mm. everyone's um, trying to breathe with their no through their nose and be calm. If it had been a Russian missile or an errant Russian missile, would things have worked out differently and be different right now? I think that I think it would have been different, but I think NATO and the United States would have made a distinction between whether it was an inadvertent 
Russian missile strike and a deliberate attempt. One thing we have to take into account here, Sean, regularly on Russian state TV, pundits which are sanctioned to speak by the Putin authoritarian regime regularly call for strikes against Poland and other Eastern European countries which are firmly behind Ukraine. Poland is one of the biggest supporters of Ukraine. The relationship between the two countries is close. Poland recognises, and it said it repeatedly publicly, this is not just about Ukraine. It's about whether um, Russia, if Ra Russia is trying to, in, in the Ukrainian, in the Polish point of view, if it succeeds in um, annexing territory from Ukraine, it will push further eastward. In other words, try to create the sphere of influence in Eastern Europe that it enjoyed during the Cold War. That's the perception of Eastern Europe, and that's why most Eastern European countries joined NATO. They did it because they feared um, a revival of Russian strategic ambitions in Eastern Europe. Historically, Eastern Europe has been seen, going back to Tsarist times, as um, part of a territory that was seen as essential to Russia's great power ambitions. Yeah. Uh, APEC, of course, underway in Bangkok. Jacinda Ardern there. Ukraine will be on the agenda when you get that many world leaders together. In reality, though, Robert, I get I get the feeling that this conflict is very much, you know, no matter what commentators say or what inter other international leaders say, this conflict actually does come down to what's happening on the ground and, mm. you know, the land that is being fought over. Yes, and I, I think you're right. And I think the scope for diplomatic negotiation has receded even further this week. Um, these missile strikes, which are intended to hurt civilians and their facilities, uh, why, why is Mr Putin doing this? Um, he's doing it so that Ukrainian citizens turn to their government and say, for God's sake, make some sort of deal with Mr. Putin because we can't go on in, in winter with, you know, these deprivations, uh, lacking access to water and electricity and, and heating. Um, but it's it's backfiring because in all the areas where and, and much of it, it, Ukraine has been affected by these missile strikes, pe people on the ground seem to be, so, it seems to be uh, having exactly the opposite effect uh, that people are absolutely determined, come what may, to resist Putin. And um, this has been one of the catastrophic miscalculations that Mr Putin's made throughout this whole full-scale invasion, that A, he seemed to believe that Ukraine, and he still does believe, is not a proper country and is not separable from Russia. About 42 million Ukrainians currently disagree with that. And secondly... Um, there's no evidence that this sort of missile strikes will turn heads in Ukraine. Um, and it seems to be having the opposite effect that making people even more resolved to resist what they see as part of a pattern of Russian imperial conquest of their country. Mm. Um, Robert, winter is coming in, um, in yep. the Northern Hemisphere and Russian winters, famously in terms of military... Um, Endeavours or military aspirations can have uh, Russian winters certainly in history have had crushing effects on invaders. Yep. Does winter, does the season mean that the ground conflict grinds to a halt, everyone digs in and waits till, you know, marching season? No, I don't think so. And uh, the Ukrainians have been prepared for this and they're much better equipped in mm. terms of cl clothing and in terms of military hardware and you have to feel for the 300 plus um, recently mobilized Russian soldiers, some of whom have had, have had no training at all and may, and little as two or three days in some cases, who are poorly equipped, don't have winter clothing. And in a sense, um, you know, they're, they're likely to be more disadvantaged. There's also signs, no signs that the Ukrainians are winding down operations. They believe uh, that they've got the Russian military uh, forces on the ground, on the uh, effect, effectively on the defensive, on the ropes, if you want to use a boxing analogy, and they will be pressing their advantage. From a military point of view, since the retreat from Kherson, um, 
Russia has been going backwards. It's, you know, let's look at the scale of the Russian reverses. More than 77,000 kilometers of territory, that's a lot of territory, Sean, yeah. have been seized yeah. or liberated in Ukrainian terms yeah. uh, since early September. And um, you know, this this is a real problem. And I don't think they'll be taking the, the foot off the, the uh, pedal. Uh, they yeah. won't be seeking, they'll be trying to take full advantage of an army in backward motion. Wow. Uh, Robert, always good to talk to you and uh, and catch you. up and get the, your perspectives on what is uh, happening there. And as I said earlier in the week, geez, it looked dodgy with the Poland thing and then, you know, things worked out okay and wise, uh, wise minds uh, prevailed and diplomacy prevailed. But as you say, uh, everything seems to be going Ukraine's way. And the more I think about it, all the conversations I've had with you, you have said this is the way it's going to play out. Has anything surprised you in the last few months? Well, I think lots of things surprised me. What has really surprised me um, is the scale of Mr. Putin's miscalculation. Mm. It's just colossal. You cannot really underestimate the miscalculation that's occurred. Yeah. I mean, uh, he didn't listen to senior figures in his own military, and he didn't listen um, to some members of the FBFSB, the intelligence community in Russia, some about 150 of whom were arrested for their trouble. Um, the idea that Russia could subdue a country of 44 million, given the size of the Russian economy, which is less than Italy's, is smaller than Italy's, uh, yeah, let's, put, let's, be, put, let's be quite frank about this. Let's just say... Mr. Putin has succeeded with his initial plan that he caught Ukrainians cold, was able to seize Kiev, mm. decapitate the Zelensky government. He still wouldn't have prevailed because there would have been a massive insurgency in Ukraine against Russia. It would have made Afghanistan look like a tea party. And Russia would have been faced with the long-term costs of trying to subdue a country in which they're not wanted, yeah. in which yeah. they're a historic memories of animosity towards Russia, particularly in the 1930s, when it was part of, the, when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. So it, it was, you know, what's happening now, I think, um, is not that surprising, yeah. given the scale of the task that Mr. Putin was seeking to take on. Yeah. Robert, thank you again uh, for your time, and we will talk thank again uh, soon. That is uh, Robert Patman, who really has given us excellent insights into the unfolding situation in the Ukraine over the last six uh, or seven months since the war began.